Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute, and today we are at Tailhook, Hook 24 out in Reno at the Grand Sierra Resort. Uh, my guest for this first episode from Tailhook 24 is Rear Admiral Rich Brophy. He's Commander of Naval Air Training up here from Pensacola. Corpus Christi. Oh, Corpus. Yeah. Okay, so I'm showing how dated I am then. A, a little bit. So uh, your headquarters is in Corpus Christi. Completely in Corpus Christi, yeah. Wow. So uh, when did that happen? I want to date you. Okay, you're going to be like the 50s. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's been a long time. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, so we've been down, headquarters down there, which is uh, which is great, because obviously we have two bases down there. Yeah. Corpus Christi, and then I have Kingsville. Yeah. So all of our... Uh, Multi-engine training and beginning training is done there in Corpus Christi. And then uh, we have jet training, of course, right over there. I'm embarrassed. No, I, it's all good. I thought Pensacola was the, the home of Sinatra. It is the cradle of naval aviation, not, not the home of the headquarters. Not the home of the headquarters. <laughs> all right. Well, in the uh, August proceedings, you and one of your JOs uh, co-authored an article called uh, How to Rebalance Naval Aviation Training. And uh, I'll just start with... You know, for a number of years, I mean, going back, we've been interviewed on this show several preceding air bosses, mm -hmm. um, and we talked about the OBOGS problem and the T-45, the pipeline uh, problems down mm -hmm. at, at Pensacola and at Corpus and, you know, all that stuff. So there's been a backlog of getting student naval aviators through the training and into the fleet replacement squadrons, right? So describe a little bit about that backlog, and then in your article you describe, hey, we're, we're now we're kind of back on top of it. Yeah. The throughput is, has increased, right? We're, we're back to where we sure. need to be. So how, how did that happen? Yeah. So first let me just say, uh, I want a, a shout out to uh, the Sinatra aide, uh, Max Showtime Chomik, okay. who actually was the one that said, I think I can write an article, because uh, I've heard you say this enough. Yep. And he's the one that first put pen to paper. So a nice. shout out goes to him for actually putting this down for the first go. So really proud of him for doing that. Uh, and he did a great job because what he's able to do is he's able to capture the challenges that Sinatra has had over the last 10 years. So if you look from 2012 all the way to 2022, Sinatra produced at 91%. 91. Okay. And so that 91%, you're like, oh, that's really good. If I played baseball, I mean, that's a great number. Yeah. The problem is that's about 60 aviators that weren't born. And those 60 aviators, we didn't get rid of them. 60 per year? 60 per year. And the Navy continued to put 100% per, back in. And so that pool continued to grow over that entire time frame. And so uh, come 2022, uh, I come to the job, and they said, uh, it's time to fix the problem with this backlog that we had created. Unfortunately, the backlog created almost a nine and a half to, depending on when you arrived down there, a 14 month wait. Yeah. When you got, you finished uh, the University of You Name It or you Naval, Naval Academy, you went down there and you waited for 14 months. Uh, that, that, that's unconscionable. Yeah. We had to fix it. And so, uh, with that, we've, we've done a lot of efforts over these last little bit. And obviously, we talk about some of that in the article. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's kind of three approaches you can take. Uh, so the, you could do the approach that we have done this in the past. Uh, every about 15 to 20 years, Sinatra has gained a pool. And the way we've approached it in the past, we've, as we've just said, just get rid of them. So when I came through in the early 90s, uh, there was a giant pool. I didn't know I was an ensign. I waited around for 14 months before I started flight training. Uh, and just people just went away. Yeah. And what they did is they just attrited them. Uh, and so we looked at it. We so said, they, they charted them, they raised the standards so that fewer... No, actually, we just, they just, they them just home. randomly picked folks and okay. sent them home. Wow. Or did a pocket board where they could then, you know, lateral transfer to other yeah. uh, other communities. So they actually did that. That was the way they did it in the past. And we didn't think that was fair. Why? Because they wanted to be naval aviators. Right. Uh, you know, let's, let's give them a chance. Another option we could have done was actually take the bottom of the floor, so you, every flight you have, you get a grade, and uh, just take the ones with the lowest grades and just kind of attrite them. Because quite frankly, they are the ones that do struggle the most out in the fleet. So we looked at that as well. We could have gotten rid of uh, you know, the requisite number. We didn't think that was fair either. 
Let's make it just like everybody else. So the only way to do that is to produce. And so uh, we looked hard at uh, how much you think we could produce, and we came up with 105% being the number that we thought that we could produce uh, based on Roy Sinatra works. Yeah. So in the article, you described the flight school factory, mm -hmm. right? And so there's, you know, you've got instructors, you've got the jets, you've got the bases, you have the training syllabus. All of these things go into it. How did you, how did you speed up the production? How did you speed up that that mm -hmm. production line? Yeah. So that, a lot of people just think, oh, you just, you know, just turn it on, just make. Have more people finish, uh, you know, the beginning phases, and then you know it, it'll work out. It, it, that's not the way queuing theory works. That's not the way a factory. I think most of us can kind of think back to Lucy or Ball yeah. with the chocolates coming off, and then it goes faster, and she's putting them in her mouth. And uh, it's quite frankly that way. Exactly. Where if you if you don't have everything synchronized, then you're just going to get pools developing. The last thing we want is a, you know wait time, especially for something like flying, you know, it's a perishable skill. Yeah. Uh, so from a factory perspective, I mean, uh, the length of the of each conveyor belt is whatever the syllabus is. So I could yeah. essentially shorten the syllabus, but am I getting a better aviator or equal to a better aviator? Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could make it wider by putting more people on, but that requires more airplanes, more instructors to be able to fly. And so when we kind of did the map on it, the best we figured as you went from, you know, stage to stage was about 105% based on the resources that we had, people and, this, and the number of uh, aircraft that we had. Okay. So you go to 105%, you've got, your, uh, you've got your instructor pilots flying more sorties, right? Are you, are you extending them into Saturdays or nights and weekends? It, so, you know, they got to yeah. ramp it up a bit, right? What, what a fantastic question. Uh, so for the most part, the answer was no, we didn't. Uh, we just, all I really asked is I said, I'm looking to have two flights a day, five days a week. Uh, now, some of it came down to, if you start getting challenged by aircraft, which we have been, especially with the T-45, where we've had just in the last uh, year and a half, three instances where we've shut down production of the T-45, there's got to be a way to make that up. Yeah. Uh, and so, unfortunately, sometimes that does come on the backs of the instructors where, all right, we got to fly seven days a week. Now, a smart man would come off of a red stripe kind of thing? Yes, sir. Exactly right. So you come off, say, a red stripe or any type of downing situation, yep. you just got to you know, start producing. Now, that what's good is we have our commanding officers are really good. Uh, and so they've actually done it where, all right, we might work seven days a week or six days a week. Cause it's always nice to have a maintenance day. Yep. And so you know, they might go, all right, you're going to work Saturday and Sunday, but I'm going to give you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. And so there, there's some smart scheduling that could, can be done. Uh, with the entire initiatives that we did for this, we actually called it Break Glass, uh, and it consisted of all different, um, including, say, for example, simulator operations. How about I fly simulators on Saturdays? And so maybe I'm not putting the stress on the instructors, but I am putting maybe a little bit more stress on the simulators. But then again, that's a contract. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that, yep. you know, it's a weekend, so you probably are paying just a little bit extra. But I'm able to, you know, the, from a student perspective, so yeah, you might be flying your tail off uh, six days a week, wow. uh, and, and they, they have been doing it. And uh, we've been actually seeing, since we started this in 2022, the entire time it's taken to get through, obviously when you start flying that much, yeah. it's decreasing. Okay. So it's, it's been in a very good way. So the pool before they start has decreased, mm -hmm. and then the, the time it takes to, once you start training through to getting winged, that's also been decreasing. So uh, that's exactly right. So we started with uh, the large pool that we had, yep. uh, which was about 1,400 aviators over what we needed. And so we had to you know, work that down. And as I said, at 105%, we actually get to what we call entitlement, or the number that we're supposed to have in tw uh, 2026. That's right. at 105% burn down. So you're still getting there. We're still getting there. Right. In fact, right now, uh, we're projecting the goal we had, we had worked towards, and we told Pack Fleet, if we wanted to get there by April of 26, to have 260 aviators that were in this pool. Uh, right now, we're showing potentially getting there in March. 
and uh, you know, great, we're going. Kind of hoping it goes a little earlier. Got it, got it. So uh, a year ago, I was here at Tailhook. I bumped into two lieutenants who were um, both at VFA 106, so the East Coast uh, Fleet Replacement Squadron for Super Hornets at Oceana. They were in the 106 patches, and so I strike up a conversation with them, and I say, you know, how are things in the FRS? Uh, and they're like, well, sir, you know, it's good, but we're also spending a lot of our time in Meridian. So they're they were instructing they were they were going three weeks a month in Meridian on TDY, instructing in the in the T forty five, and one week a month back at the FRS flying Super Hornets in Oceana. And and they weren't un, you know unhappy about it, but they're like, you know, it's a bit stressful. Yep. And there's a lot of pretty and that's not so bad. Um, but we're in both places. And that was to give you more instructor pilots. Yeah, so uh, the challenge that we actually had at that point, once the airplanes came back up, yep. uh, was, okay, how do we get up on step? I need, you know, I need aircraft and I need instructors in order to be able to fly the, you know, the 10 flights I'm looking for in a week. We didn't have enough instructors. When you produce, and if you look at the jet community, I said 91%, that's yep. everybody. The jet community has been producing at about 76%. Wow. Over okay. 10 years. Wow. And so that essentially means... There's 25% less instructors and people that are out there. So when it comes to the production tour, you know, you got to fill Nautic, you got to go fill the FRSs, yep. you got to fill us. There's, we're 25% we're short. Yeah. And so if you want to produce at that rate, I, I had to raise it. And so we made a conscious choice to actually take folks from the FRS, fill Sinatra, while we ended up writing a contract and get contract instructors to kind of fill that gap. Yeah. And so... Uh, it, it lasted about eight to nine months. Okay. We had instructors down there. They're all back now. Uh, we could not have done it without them, without those instructors who were phenomenal. They came down. They were motivated. Um, they griped a little bit. Like I would, if they didn't, I'd be like, "Come on, you're a aviator. That's what the do. Right. That's just what JOs do." Yeah. But they were phenomenal. They came down. That's they great. actually saved Sinatra. Okay. They got us back up on step. Allowed us to rewrite the contracts. Allowed us to hire folks. And so now we have about. 35 contract instructors on our books to kind of make up for that delta that's so out there. So T-45 instructor pilots. Yes, sir. That are contractors. Yep, they're okay. contractors. So a lot of them, are most of them prior naval aviators? 100% are. Okay. Yeah, they're all prior naval aviators, everyone from a, a former commanding officer to a lieutenant that, quite frankly, he was done with his commitment and decided just to stay on and, you know, use all of his qualifications and just continue teaching there. Uh, I would expect that, that program is going to last until all of the folks that we're producing now. We're producing pretty well. I mean, 101 percent last year. We're on track for 103 percent this year. But those folks need to go all the way through their C tour, and then when they come back, yeah. you'll finally have the right number of folks who you properly balance. Yeah. Not just in Sinatra, but quite uh, you know across the fleet. Got it. Got it. All right. Last question. Um, so the T45, which you mentioned. Uh, is coming towards the end of its service life, right? It's been in the fleet for 30-odd years, yeah, right. right? So that's a long time. Um, and it's had some notable, you know, deficiencies in the last decade, uh, which is not unusual for an older airplane. Um, what, what's going to replace it? Sure. So the T-45, like you said, I mean, it's 30-plus years flying. Uh, I kind of, I think of it as tired iron. Yeah. Uh, at some point, it's just, it just becomes really expensive to try to keep that flying. Right. And so, and not just that, the, the training value that we're getting out of it is only about 60% of the, of the core competencies that we need for the F-18. Yeah. So, I mean, she's just, she's a great airplane when we bought her and she's been great for the last 20 years, but yeah. she's just getting old. So the, uh, the undergraduate jet training system or U-Jets is the replacement aircraft. Okay. Uh, that's, that's what the program is called. That's exactly right. That's the program that's out there. Uh, NAVAIR has already put out solicitations for it. Um, you know, requests for information has gone out. We've gone back and forth a little bit of that. So it's out there. Uh, we're definitely looking at you know, what's the replacement. Yeah, of course, there's lots of companies that have uh, great products. There are. There'll, be a, there'll be a competition and then a, a down select and all of that stuff will happen. It is, and we're already starting to work. That. And that's a NAVAIR systems problem. Na Na right? Na NAVAIR, so uh, if you want to okay. dive into that, ask NAVAIR oh, those hard NAVAIR. questions. Okay. Uh, so. Got it, got it. All right, well, this is great. Um, the last, actually, the uh, follow-on to that one 
is uh, taking um, uh, orange and white jets to the boat, right? So carrier calls while you're still in Sinatra before you get your air, before you get your wings, right? So historically, students have taken A4s, my my year group, right, and T45s, you know, more recently to the boat and gotten their first yep. CQs at the boat in an orange and white jet. Um, you just whispered to me that that stopped yep. recently, mm -hmm. and so and and there's been you know articles written about how the future whatever replaces the T45 also probably won't go to the boat, right? right? Talk about yeah. that for a bit. So absolutely. So, uh, so what we did is we created a program. Uh, there is a system in both the F-18 and in the F-35 called precision landing mode. Uh, it is an absolutely different way of flying the ball and fly and landing on the back of an aircraft carrier. I have over a thousand traps doing it manually. Uh, I tried it when I was a strike group admiral. Easiest thing ever. Like my first pass, I'm like. Where has this been my whole life? And what we've found with us using precision landing mode, you know, the, the landing grades have gone way up. Yep. Uh, the number of times that you're having to go around has gone way down. So it has become super accurate uh, and, su and a lot safer out there, both day and night. Okay. And so we, we looked at that and we said, so do we need to really go to the boat in the T-45? We created a program. Uh, and we put, there's about 160 folks that were in this program to actually look at it to go, okay, do we really need to go to the boat um, to, to CQ yeah. in the T-45? You go through all of the normal field carrier landing practices that you would in the T-45. We just took you away when, when it came to the time to go to the boat. Yeah. We just didn't send you. We sent you to, to uh, the FRS to do it. Okay. We've had 64 folks go through. Of the 64, we've had eight DQ, and of those eight that DQ'd, some were well, they, they were they weren't even going to make it, even if uh, so they DQ'd in the FRS. DQ'd in the FRS. Okay. Of those eight, uh, one never came back. He had problems before that. To be honest, the rest came back and did just fine the second go around. Oh, okay. that. Got it. And so, uh, and, and was that any different than? Previously, when you would when you would CQ in a T forty five and go to the right, it is a little bit higher, okay. uh, but it is it is very much within the statistical norms that we anticipated that it okay. would be. And from a safety perspective, which is my biggest concern, yeah. uh, the commanding officers of both uh, the FRSs say you are not giving us any extra risk. Okay. And even the LSOs, when I talk to them, uh, they tell me, "Hey, I, bring them." I, I can't tell yeah. if that pilot that's coming around is someone that was in the program or not. And so with all of that data, the Airbus actually looked at it in May yep. and said, if you are a strike aviator, you do not need to go to the boat in the T-45. For the E-2 folks, they do still go to the boat. Okay. So that, that's about 26 folks that we have for a year to do that. But the E-2 doesn't have PLM. They do not have PLM. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. And you're saving what? A couple weeks of training in the, take, in the pipeline? So you are saving time in training. Yeah. Uh, you're saving wear and tear on the aircraft. Yeah. When we did a CQ, uh, every time we did CQ, we'd have about 40 airplanes go out there. Yeah. Uh, and then about 40 instructors. And so that, it's kind of a long time that you don't have these assets to train, let alone you don't have a bunch of aircraft carriers now. And so you're at the, you're at the whim of when the aircraft carrier is available. Right. And so... That was driving the time to train to significant lengths for something that, quite frankly, you probably don't need right. in strike aviation. Great. So. All right. Well, my guest has been Rear Admiral Rich Brophy, Commander of Naval Aviation Training, and he is in Corpus Christi, Texas, yes. <laughs> not in Pensacola. Thank you for that correction, sir. Yep, sir. And thanks for writing for Proceedings you and bet, for Max bro. writing for Proceedings. Yeah, you bet. Bro. And, uh, yeah, I got to say, this is uh, it's nice to be in the, in the Grand Sierra, this is a nicer, newer uh, venue here, better than the Nugget was. It uh, is. And uh, this is Thursday, and it feels like a Friday of Tailhook. Normally, Friday is very busy. Thursday is pretty quiet. This is feeling more like a Friday, so I think we're off to a great, great start. I, I to, think we are, to, too. To Hook 24. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. This is great. great.